Let us call one another to worship this day. Thus says the Lord who created you, who formed you. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. The rivers shall not overwhelm you, for I am the Lord your God. You are our God. We are your people. Alleluia. Amen. be seated. Brothers and sisters, not out of fear or dread, but believing that God is faithful to forgive, let us let go of the things we need to carry no longer. Let us confess our sin together. Despite your repeated assurance, despite the familiar refrain of fear not, still we are a fearful, fretful people, O God. You invite us to greet each day with gladness, but sometimes we greet our days with dread, worried about what the future holds. Remind us that nothing can separate us from your love. Remind us that your long embrace is dependable and sure. Remind us that your faithfulness is steadfast. Give us such deep faith in your promises that we might learn to live with joy, facing the future with an unwavering trust in you, through Christ our Lord.
hear this good news. There is no sin so great that God has not forgiven it. There is no one so sinful that God does not love them. And so I declare to you this morning, in the name of Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven. And so, friends, in Christ, in response to this good news, how then shall we live? With gratitude, following after the Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. This is the way of Jesus, in whom we find life.
It's nice to be reminded we're still in Christmas tide. And so, Megan, thank you so much. I'm not Jennifer Ingram. You probably knew that. Uh, and I'm doing a poor imitation of her. Uh, uh, Jennifer was scheduled to do a moment for mission today. She is one of our incoming elders and is a longtime member of our mission committee and was going to talk with you today a little bit about FPC serves. And so uh, I'm going to stand in her place and share some of what she was going to share. FPC serves, we, we try to play on that, uh, on our FPC name in different ways. Uh, FPC shares is how we support uh, food pantries around. FPC at work is a monthly way for us to be reminded of how we are engaged in the world through one of our various ministries. FPC serves is a once a year opportunity for us to come together as a group and go out into the community uh, and, and seek to make a difference with some of the mission partners with whom we are associated. This will be our second FPC Serves uh, initiative. Carol Ann last year was hoping and praying that 50 people might show up. I think we tripled her uh, uh, guesstimate. It was a wonderful gathering. We had young people from the Presbyterian Campus Ministry come and join us in this. This is, this is trying to join in a nationwide movement to turn the Monday of the Martin Luther King Jr. weekend into a day of hands-on service. You should have received a little uh, a brochure in a recent newsletter that looked something like this. Hopefully you did. What will happen is on the 20th of January, Monday morning, uh, we will, you'll be in, you're invited to come join us at 8 in the mor 8 o'clock in the morning for a light breakfast. We will then go out into the parking lot for a blessing of a car, uh, a Wheels for Hope car will be uh, given to a recipient. Uh, Wheels for Hope, as you know, is one of our partner uh, ministries. We'll share in the celebration of that car dedication, and then those who are here will uh, head out to various places in the area, some staying here at the church. To, be, uh, uh, to spend the morning uh, sharing in some hands-on ministry. You may be wondering if you're qualified to do any of these. Uh, they range from uh, good old-fashioned manual labor. For example, last year I participated with a group of young people pulling weeds at the Interfaith Food Shuttle Farm. And that's what I plan to do again this year because it's eminently satisfying. You know when your row of weeds is is gone, and uh, it's uh, not everything I do can I see an end point, but it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, but there are some that, that are fairly sedentary. One of the jobs will be sending folks to the Green Chair Project, and if you can sit down, which they need people to test furniture to see if it is comfortable to, to give. So if you can sit, raise your hand if you can sit. <laughs> Uh, you're qualified for that particular ministry that day. And so there's a whole list of things. There, there, there's working at food pantries. There's, there's uh, packing and, and putting postage on uh, materials that would be sent around the world through Christian Library International. Uh, lots of things going on. You can visit homebound members of our church family. You can work on various projects on our own site. Or you can even keep the nursery so that young families can come, uh, drop their children off here, and then fall Fully participate in the morning. Lots of ways to be involved. All ages can participate. We do need to know that you're planning to come though and so you can sign up through uh, the church website or give us a call this week to let us know that you uh, plan to attend. It, and, and, and while most of the projects go from 9 till noon, what I know is that several groups decided to go ahead and eat lunch together afterward to continue the experience of being together with church family. So that's FPC Serves. It's a way for us to uh, actively engage with hands and feet and hearts in some of the ministries with whom we are associated around our city. So I encourage your involvement. It'll be a wonderful day for us to share together uh, serving the Christ who calls us to service. Well, I'm not Jennifer Ingram either, although my name begins with I. And uh, I greatly admire the fact she does research over at Duke, very fine university, right up there with Notre Dame. <clears throat> Speaking of celebrations, uh, the Hilda Yarbo was planning to be, did, did the Yarbos make it to church? I did not. There you are, okay. Take a good look at Hilda Yarbo. Well, you don't have to look at Frank so much, but Hilda... <clears throat> Is, well, is, I guess, the last remaining member of the four-square class. And on the first of the year, she turned 100. 
and she doesn't take a single medication. And, and you must be Joy, are you her daughter? Okay, daughter Joy brought her. Joy's looking after them. They moved to a very nice new apartment out near Holly Springs. And, and Frank, the young guy, is taking care of the cooking and stuff. But it's just a, a joy to have you here, Hilda, celebrating the great 100. It's that good four square living. It uh, keeps you going. Uh, let's see, another celebration. The daughter of Ben and Alice Butler, Julia Butler, you know, has been in and out of Duke, had some heart surgery. Um, and then had some uh, fluid on her lungs, had to go back, but she has been home and is recuperating and feeling better every day, and I th think uh, Julia will be going back to school on Tuesday. She should have a, quite an essay to write, my operation. Among our uh, concerns this morning, um, the son of Larry Wilson died on Christmas Day. The service for Mark Wilson was held here on Thursday, and we just found out this morning from Ginger Beatty, who just found out that a former church member, uh, Jackie Grillo, died back in October. You may remember Jackie and Donato. Um, Donato was the artist. He designed our older adult uh, bulletin one Sunday. And uh, they moved about 12 years ago to Illinois to be near their son. So we're just now finding out about the death of uh, Jackie Grillo. And oh, and one other uh, celebration to, uh, to, cel to uh, share with you. We it was certainly a concern uh, a couple of weeks ago when you all started praying for Don Haig, who is uh, known to us as the other grandpa of Bruce McLeod, uh, Ed, Ed and uh, Je Jenny's uh, grandson. Uh, Don Haig was critically ill on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, did not look like he was going to pull out of that, but uh, prayers have been answered and he continues to improve and looks to come home from the hospital in uh, Maryland soon. So. Uh, the Haig family and the McLeods were touched by many prayers and are very appreciative. I think that's all I have. May we come to God in this time of prayer with the words of that uh, grand old hymn ringing in our ears, sweet hour of prayer calls us from a world of care. My soul has often found relief in seasons of distress and grief. Sweet hour of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, on the precipice of this new year, which we may be eyeing as filled with potential or perhaps fraught with peril, walk with us, great shepherd, so that we can walk through the waters, through the fire, with no fear, knowing you are with us. Lord, fill us with the faith that you are all around us, that we have nothing to fear since absolutely nothing in this life or the next can separate us from your love. Lord, help us to fret less and serve more, putting our trust in you and lifting our eyes to see our neighbor in need. And then in Christian love, using the gifts you've given us to help shape this corner of the world into your vision for all creation. This morning, we especially thank you for the life of Hilda Yarbo, as she has walked with you for an entire century. Eternal Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray that you would guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, so that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we won't forget you, but will remember that we are ever walking in your sight, hand in hand, in the spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to come forward for a time together at the front of the church. 
Come on up. Come on up. Come on. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You waiting on a couple others? Good morning. Great group. Good morning. Well, I'm so glad to see you guys this morning. How is everybody? Are you awake? You're good? You're good? Well, I know Christmas is over. Technically, it's not over, but it seems pretty over. It feels like it's been a long time since Christmas already, since it was just here. But since you know I always get songs in my head, I have had the carol, We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We, there you got it. We wish you a Merry Christmas and uh, Happy, New Happy New Year. Happy New Year. That's the holiday we celebrated since the last time we were together. Even since last Sunday, we've had another holiday. Happy New Year. Has anybody said Happy New Year to you? Anybody? Yes? When we say Happy New Year to each other, what we are really saying to each other is, in these days and weeks to come, I am hoping good things for you. Happy New Year. I am hoping good things for you in the days to come. That seems like a good thing to do for people. Sometimes when we make resolutions, it's, they're hard to keep. That's a good one to be able to keep. I am hoping good things for you. Well, we tell a story around Christmas time about Jesus, about baby Jesus and how he was born. And we've been telling that story for weeks now. But there's actually another story about baby Jesus, and I wonder if you know it. We tell it around the new year. Listen to the story about what happened after Jesus was born. After Jesus was born in the manger and the angels had gone away and the shepherds went back to their fields and the wise men went home and the animals went back to doing the things that animals do, Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus went home too. And like all parents with a newborn baby, Mary and Joseph looked at each other and said, now what? What do we do next? You see, for Mary and Joseph, it was hard to imagine what life would be like for them with a new baby in the house after Jesus was born. Now they were home and things had kind of returned to normal. And so Mary and Joseph went back to their normal routines, back to school, back to work. And when the day came to go to worship, they went to worship, kind of like here we are sitting in worship. That's just something we do as a part of our normal life. And so that's what they did. And they brought baby Jesus with them into the sanctuary. But they got a surprise when they got in the sanctuary. When they came in the door, a very old man named Simeon jumped up. Can you imagine it? Simeon jumped up and he ran over to Mary and Joseph and he ran over to baby Jesus and he took baby Jesus in his arms and he said, hallelujah, this is who I have been waiting for. This is the baby that is a gift from God and I have waited a long time to meet him. See, Simeon looked at Jesus and knew that God loved him was a strange thing for him to do. And Mary and Joseph were sort of amazed by this, that, that, that Simeon, who wasn't there when Jesus was born, he wasn't at the manger, but he knew who Jesus was, just like the angels and the shepherd and the wise men did. Well, this story makes me want to say, Happy New Year, because it reminds me that we are all hoping for good things and that we are all waiting for new beginnings. And it reminds us that God is hoping good things for you, too, the very best things. The good news is that Christmas doesn't end. It's the beginning of the story. And so my hope for you, when I say Happy New Year to you, what I'm hoping is I hope good things for you. I hope good things for you. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for new beginnings. Thank you for new beginnings. Help us to hope good things for each other. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Let's go back to your seat.
Let us pray for illumination. O God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear what you are saying to us today. Amen. Our first lesson is from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you, I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For our second reading, we turn to Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome, the eighth chapter, beginning our reading at the 31st verse. Listen again to God's word for us. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. And again, let us pray. Pour out your blessing upon us, O God. Give us the gift of your spirit. That the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A popular film about a dozen years ago was a science fiction movie entitled Signs. At one level, it was a movie about space aliens planning and orchestrating an attack on planet Earth and about the human community gathering together to repel that attack. It's a pretty popular movie genre. But the underneath story, the more important story, was that of the main character, played by Mel Gibson, who portrayed an Episcopal priest who had lost his faith in God following the tragic death of his young wife. 
Having assumed that God had turned his back on him, Mel Gibson's character decided to turn his back on God and was planning to live the rest of his life ignoring God, even denying God's presence in the world. I won't tell you the whole story here, though it's, the movie's been around about 10 years. If you were going to see it, you probably already have. But for our purposes, I'm only really concerned about one moment in the film where the characters have the most explicit discussion of faith I've ever seen in a movie. At a particularly gripping moment in the story, when it looks like all might be lost, Mel Gibson turns to his despairing younger brother and says, in effect, there are two kinds of people in the world. Some people can look upon an extraordinarily frightening experience and they will panic and they'll think the world is out of control, guided only by chance and fate, so they have no hope and they think they're alone. And then there are those people who, even when the worst happens, even when unimaginable evil occurs and life-threatening disaster looms, they believe that there is a benevolent God working for good, watching over them, standing with them, so that even in the midst of tragedy and trial, they don't lose hope. At which point, the fearful younger brother looked up at his older brother, hoping for some encouragement, and he said, which one are we? At which point, the one-time priest said, We're on our own. Now, a great many people in our world hold to that position. But if there's one thing that the God of Scriptures makes clear to us from the beginning to the end, it's that we're not on our own. Again and again, God makes a very clear promise. Again and again, God says, I will be with you. In fact, in the Old Testament, God says that very thing, those words, 12 times. You can look it up, but I already did. I'll save you the trouble. 12 times. Once to Abraham, once to Jacob. Three times he said it to Moses. Every time Moses got a little anxious about what he was being asked to do, where he was being sent to go, what he was being asked to say, every time he expressed those concerns to God, God said, I will be with you. And then as Joshua prepared to lead the people of God into the promised land, he heard it four times. Four times. Joshua had a daunting task before him, a task he could not have handled all by himself, but he didn't have to handle it all by himself. God said, I will be with you. 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 And then in addition to Abraham, Jacob, Moses, and Joshua, God also said it to Gideon and to Jeroboam a couple of lesser-known biblical characters who needed this assurance as well. And then, whether you know it or not, God makes the promise to you. I will be with you. The first 11 times God makes this promise, it's to specific individuals. But here in the 43rd chapter of Isaiah, God speaks to Israel, the chosen people of God, the covenant people whose lineage we claim. And to them, to us, God makes the promise, I will be with you. This is what God said, I've called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Why? Because I am with you, says God. I am with you. Mel Gibson says there are two kinds of people in the world, those who believe God is with them and those who don't. Those who believe God is with them as a source of security in an insecure world and those who think they are on their own. And this is not an insignificant matter because what we believe about this will shape us, it will color the way we look at the world. It will determine whether we live our lives as hopeful people or despairing people. And so it is an important self-exercise, an exercise in self-examination to figure out which sort of people we are. 
are we, you and I, the sort of people who live with a confident trust, with a hopeful faith that come what may, God is with us, overcoming evil with good and in all things working for good? Or are we the sort of people who think that we're pretty much on our own? Not just living in a randomly ordered universe, but living alone in a randomly ordered universe. No God. No grace. No hope. Now, sometimes it is the trauma and turbulence of our lives that shakes our faith and makes us wonder if we're alone. But look again at the text. God doesn't say, since I am with you, you will live a life free from tragedy and trial. Instead, God says, when you pass through the waters, they will not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, not if, but when. When you walk through the fire, the flame shall not consume you. Why? Because I am the Lord your God, and I am with you. What this means is, is that a pain-free and trauma-free life is not the evidence that God is with us, that we have strength to endure in the midst of our seasons of pain and trauma. That is what reminds us that God is with us. For there will be raging water that threatens to engulf us. There will be raging fire that threatens to consume us. That's just a given in this life. If you haven't faced it in one form or another, you will. But it's also a given that God is with us, that God is present, that God will not forsake us. That's what God told Abraham and Jacob and Moses and Joshua and Gideon and Jeroboam, and that's what God has told us. And if we didn't get it, having heard it again and again and again, when Jesus is born into the world, an angel reminds Mary of the ancient prophecy that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him what? Emmanuel. God with us. And so the very presence of Jesus in the world is God's way of telling us one more time I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm sure you know that the African nation of the Sudan has been a warring, violent, deathly place for years. And that for a time, South Sudan was continuing that tradition. There are recent glimmers of hope there. But in reading of some of the recent horrors, I was reminded of a story I read years ago about four Sudanese refugees who, who made their way to Louisville, Kentucky, of all places. As you probably know, the Sudan was a place of extreme Muslim-Christian conflict, a place where government-sponsored terror and injustice and inhumanity had turned thousands of people into refugees. And one group of these refugees became known as the Lost Boys or the Walking Boys. These were young boys, many of whom were Christian, forced from their homes and villages, fleeing either death or slavery. And from villages all over southern Sudan, they began walking east, hoping for a better life. Eventually, these small groups of boys from individual villages met up with other small groups of boys until there were a thousand of them, journeying together, hoping to survive. They first made it to Ethiopia, but the warfare, warfare there was so great that that wasn't safe. And so they pressed on to Kenya, having walked some of them for more than a thousand miles. Many of them died along the way. Many were mauled by lions, some killed by alligators as they crossed rivers in the middle of the night. It was an ordeal that those of us sitting here in our comfort can't even begin to imagine. But one of them, named Gabriel, 
in telling this terrible story of deprivation and hardship, added this. But God was with us. God led us by day. God led us by night. God was with us, guiding us, providing water for us, delivering us. You don't even know Gabriel, but you know now what kind of person he is. He's one of those kinds of people who endures hardship and suffering and trial and through it all trusts that a benevolent God is at work. Bringing good out of evil. Working in all things, even in the midst of despicable things for the good of his own children. Trusting that even in the midst of that raging water and consuming fire, that God was present, just like God promised to be. In one of my very first churches, one of the Sunday school teachers had a wonderful habit of teaching the children to think of themselves as a person of worth. That's the language she used because God valued them. So they would learn to say their name, and they, it was sort of like this. They would say, I'm Jane Smith, God's beloved child, a person of worth. <laughs> Not a bad thing for a child to know. It's the very thing that God was trying to communicate with the people of Israel, and through Christ, this is what God is trying to communicate to us. In the same text in which God tells us that he will be with us, he says, I have called you by name. You are mine. You are precious in my sight. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the truth about us is that we don't really know our worth until someone tells us. A child who is not loved will assume they are unlovable. A person who is ignored will assume they count for nothing. Anyone who is not valued will question their value. And certainly it wouldn't occur to us that we were precious in God's sight unless God let us know. And here, that's what God is doing. In the birth of Jesus, that's what God has done. I've called you by name. You're mine. You're precious in my sight. Now that doesn't mean, and we shouldn't suggest to our children that it means that our lives will be easy, that the waves will always be gentle, or the fire will not sometimes burn out of control. But the best thing we can do for our children, in addition to letting them know that they belong in God's treasure chest, is to let them know that we are the sort of people, that we are the sort of people, who in the presence of crisis and calamity trust and believe that God is at work, that God is with us and for us, that in all things, come what may, though we may not understand it, that God is at work for good. So what kind of people are we? How have we chosen to look at the world? Do we trust and believe that God is with us, keeping the promises made to us? Or do you think you're getting by on your own, facing the raging water and the searing fire all by yourself? Now, the truth is, God is with us whether we notice it or not. But those who notice, those who notice God and in noticing God, trust. Well, they are the ones, and you've seen them. They are the ones in whom we see deep joy and strong serenity 
the sort of joy and serenity that has only one source, but which is available to us all. Through Christ our Lord, to God be the glory now and forever. Amen. Please remain standing as we affirm what we believe using the traditional words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us affirm what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. One way we know God is with us is that feeling we get when we, out of gratitude, give to God, trusting that God will provide and trusting that God will guide us to use our combined resources to, to do God's work here in this corner of the kingdom. Let us joyfully give to God our tithes and offerings.
Dear God, we trust in you. We trust that you will enable us to use these gifts wisely, with faith, and with much love, serving in Christ's name. Amen. Unless I miss my guess, all of our life's journeys have or will take us to mountaintops of exaltation and dark valleys of sadness and sorrow. There will be times when all is calm and all is bright, and then there will be times when the waters rage and the fire consumes. But the one constant is God's faithfulness to be and abide with us. Trust that faithfulness as you go from this place and as you go to live the rest of your lives to the glory of God. And now may grace, mercy, and peace, the triune blessing of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you, with those you love and with God's people everywhere, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.